This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. Well, all of us were babies once, and all of us had to go from being a baby to growing up somewhere along the line, and somebody had to raise us. So how do we get from point A to point B? We're gonna need some help on this one, and we have an expert, Dr. Lisa Stellwagen, who is a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and medical director of the Newborn Service. Welcome. Thank you. Now, when I was getting ready to talk to you, it occurred to me that we could subtitle this, it's not your mother's baby anymore, <laughs> or it's not your mother's pregnancy anymore. It's, things have really changed. Yeah. There, there are four million births a year, roughly, in the United States. And, and those people are born all over the place. What are the kinds of facilities that we're looking at now that babies are born at? So I think um, most babies are born in the hospital, and there are big teaching hospitals like our hospital, and there are small community hospitals and small birthing centers. And so that parents have a lot of option in this day and age about where they're gonna have their baby and what kind of a delivery environment they can choose. So what do those differences mean? Are, are there places that are better or are they just different and they give you different advantages depending upon what you're looking for? I think different advantages. I, I probably have a bias towards the academic center where um, I think at UCSC we're, we're unique because we, we really promote a naturalistic approach. We have a birth center where people can have a low intervention, midwife delivery. So this is even in a hospital, you can create that kind of environment. Exactly, but if you need the help, if you need neonatal intensive care unit, if your baby needs any intervention, they're right down the hall. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell the story. Uh, five, a little over five and a half years ago, I, my wife and I have our kids at UCSD, and uh, my littlest one turns purple. I mean, we're in UCSD, we're up on the floor, and I got to watch you in action, not just as a friend, <laughs> not just as a colleague, but I got to watch you save my kid's life and make a difference. And the fact that we were in UCSD, I mean, during that moment, all I could think about was, thank God we're here, and, and that you were there. Because the, to have that sort of pleasant, wonderful experience, and my wife thought the experience from her standpoint was just really beautiful and, and warm. But I'm thinking as a doctor, and, and you know, hopefully you never need it kind of thing, we needed it. And I watched the entire hospital go click on your authority and your, you know, your decision making and make a difference for a kid who needed it right then and there. So I, I've lived that moment that we had both sides of it. And I get to publicly say thank you. <laughs> but, but I, but I yeah, but, but I, get to, I got to see what you mean by that. So somebody who gives birth at home, which sounds beautiful, what they don't have is you. Right, and most of the time everything goes fine, but I think that this appreciation that the, the completely natural um, way of having a baby in the old days worked most of the time, but the, the people lost half of their children hundreds of years ago, and that it's, it's good to take advantage of the medical care that's available when you need it. And I think trying to pick a place, though, that will honor that more naturalistic approach if you want it, uh, keeping the baby with you, breastfeeding, um, less intervention, not taking the baby away from the family. We really work hard, very hard on doing that. But then again, if, if you're there, if, if you have a problem, we're there. And also not, not rejecting some of the modern medical advances that are really um, helping us have healthier children. So there's really a movement of bringing the best of both worlds together. Exactly. Uh, so the old vision of yeah, you have your baby, it's taken away from you, and, and then maybe they, the nurse comes back and shows you your baby in some crib all cleaned up, and then you look over and you go, or the babies are all stacked up and the father's looking through the window. That's mine. No, wait, wait, that one's mine. Yeah. That's gone. It's gone. I, um, we are what's called a baby-friendly hospital. It's a UNICEF World Health Organization program that promotes this bonding of the parents, and breastfeeding is the main thrust of it. But this, the, the way we do it, the baby 
really never leaves the parent's side unless there's an urgent problem. And right at delivery, the baby's put on the mother's chest, and we, we don't bathe them. We dry them off a little bit. We don't even wipe off the vernix that's on their skin. It's good for their skin. And the baby transitions on the mother's chest, and they do so much better. So, that so much less skin stress. To, yeah, that's skin to skin. Uh, you know, it sounds wonderful, and it sounds very humanistic, but it turns out there's significant medical positives to that. There's biomarkers that you can show that help the child. It, that's astounding. Amazing. And you know, there's a lot of interest now in the bacterial population of the intestinal tract. And this starts at delivery. The baby's born with a mostly sterile gut, and they're to get bacteria from their parents. They're not supposed to get it from the nurse in the newborn nursery. And so we think, too, the skin to skin is another way of the baby acquiring the proper bacterial balance, which may be important for um, lifelong health. You talked about the vernix that's on the skin. Uh, you know, the first, uh, you want to go and clean them up. And so but that's not a really smart thing to do. So the baby st sits there with that stuff on them, quote unquote. Why is that really a positive? Yeah, you know, the, the vernix is um, a lipid, water, kind of a waterproof layer that protects the, the baby in the intrauterine environment, but it also has antibacterial factors. It helps the, um, the change of the skin from a fluid environment to an air environment. And for 50 years in this country, we've been, we've been washing it off and we need to leave it on. And despite what people think, within an hour or two, it's pretty much dried into the skin and you don't even see it. So there's really no need to rush to bathe the baby. And I think, and, and really it's something that we should let nature's, nature's um, skin therapy to take its course. So we're skin to skin, we're leaving the burnings on, and everything sounds so natural. And then a kid gets a shot of something and <laughs> gets ointment in their eyes, right. which you know I'm interested in obviously as a <laughs> pediatric ophthalmologist. But so, so there's the medical side being mixed with this naturalistic side, which turns out to have very significant medical benefits. What, what's the shot? What's the ointment? Yeah, so the ointment, erythromycin ointment, is put in the eyes to prevent gonorrhea and chlamydia. And gonorrhea used to be the leading cause of blindness in this country. And um, that has gone away with the, with the implementation of the erythromycin ointment. I think the vitamin K is particularly important because people used to lose children. As I mentioned, half of children used to die to infectious disease and hemorrhage. Um, vitamin K is, is low in the newborn, and we feel it's very important that the baby get the vitamin K injection to prevent a hemorrhagic disease or a brain bleed that can happen in one in 100 children. Now, we hold off on those two things for a couple hours after delivery. So we're not in there the first 10 minutes. The baby stays with the parents after two hours, but by six hours, we like to give the vitamin K and the eye ointment. There have been attempts to give other, uh, other ways of giving vitamin K uh, besides shots. Uh, and because parents don't want their kid to get a shot right away. Do we know if those work as well? So oral vitamin K, which is used widely in Europe, is not as effective as the injected vitamin K. And the thing that people need to understand about the injection of vitamin K is it's a what we call a depot shot. It's in oil and it sits in the muscle and releases slowly vitamin K over the first months of life. In Europe, the countries that use the oral vitamin K have higher levels of babies that have brain bleeds. And um, several European countries have gone back to the injected vitamin K. There's also no available um, preparation of oral vitamin K that's approved by the FDA. So it's really something we discourage. And I think people should look into it carefully if they're considering rejecting the injected vitamin K that we recommend. So the baby's born, we, we have this beautiful skin to skin contact, the vernix is still on, they, they, a few hours later they might get their shot, they might get a little ointment in their eyes. Uh, at some point there's two vital things that have to happen baby's going to eat and the baby's going to sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and so now we're going to combine what we know from medicine with natural approaches from Mother Nature that has taught us a lot. You're a lactation expert. Mm -hmm. Baby's hungry. What happens now? You know, the, um, this, this, the breastfeeding is this most beautiful thing, this very important thing for the baby's health, but it's different for every mother-baby pair. And most babies are not born with that much hunger. They do the first 24 hours, they do a little nursing and help the mother establish her milk supply. And I think the key is that we don't interfere with that. We don't interfere by interrupting it and taking the baby away, giving the baby unnecessary Can you explain feeding. that for a second, how the baby helps the mother? Yeah, so milk production is um, partially um, initiated with the, the delivery, but the baby suckling at the breast is really the principal driver of milk production. And so when you don't have the baby suckling at the breast because the baby has a pacifier or a bottle in their mouth, you can delay that milk production. So we tell mothers just to, to don't, don't watch the clock, just let the baby nurse whenever they want to bring that milk in as quickly as they can. And uh, it, it seems natural 
people have to be taught how to do this? Yeah, I, I think um, I think in some ways they do. And in the in the olden days, little girls grew up watching babies be breastfed. They were taught. We just didn't think about it that way. And so we've really lost that in our culture. And a lot of women come to delivery having never seen a baby breastfeed. So we do find that we have to do a little bit of teaching. Some babies and mothers need minimal intervention, and others need more intervention. But I think we've tried to promote this just this culture of um, breastfeeding that, that helps each mother and baby learn what they need to learn. So, so why bother? What, what are the advantages of breast milk, both to the mother and to the child? Yeah. So I think just immense advantages from the infant in terms of proper growth. I mentioned the bacterial flora establishment, less um, infections of every type if the baby is breast milk fed. The risk of crib death, which I know we're so going to... I'm sorry to stop you, but less infections immediately, less infections lifetime, less infections during infancy? Um, all of yes. the above. <laughs> okay. You know, for, for a premature baby, breast milk is really, um, we, we say it's almost mandatory because the infection rate is so much less in a premature baby. But in a full-term baby, it really, it, um, it just assists them in fighting infection of all types, ear infection, bladder infection, meningitis, really amazing protection. Allergies? So there is some evidence that there's less allergies and asthma during the time the baby's being breastfed. The only um, definitive proof is that it decreases the risk of eczema. So that's been very clearly um, demonstrated. The others are perhaps some benefit, but it's still the jury's out on that. Differing recommendations on how long someone should breastfeed. Yeah. So the American Academy of Pediatrics that has looked at this matter very closely feels that um, they are encouraging people to breastfeed the baby exclusively. That means just the breast, if everybody's doing well, for six months. And then most people introduce food, and they recommend extending that um, breastfeeding with complementary food till one year and beyond if mother and baby are doing well with it. Um, I always felt like if the baby says, Mom, I'm hungry, can I have some breast milk? It's probably too long. <laughs> I don't know. You no. know, we're, uh, we're, we're encouraging people to go for one or two years, and uh, it's amazing. In San Diego, we have a, a very nice culture of breastfeeding, and a lot of people breastfeed two years. But breastfeeding a two-year-old is not eight times a day. The baby might nurse when they're put to bed or when they get up from a nap, and then gradually they're going to wean off. And I, I'm seeing more and more in our community, at the very least, um, an acceptance of breastfeeding out and about. Mm -hmm. Culturally, mm -hmm. our society seems to sort of support that without it being a big deal. I felt like when we were growing up, it was different. It's totally different. I think it was really um, discouraged. You know, when we when we were starting out, it was discouraged. But it has become. You see it on TV and on um, advertisements. I think it's really important because we need to send that message that this is pr the preferred method of infant nutrition. And you asked me about the benefits to the mother, and the benefits to the mother are not small. Uh, decreased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And recent studies have shown that women that breastfeed um, a total of 12 months, like. Three, you know, even three children, but all together you add up all your months, decreased risk of heart attack, stroke, hypertension, diabetes. A huge protection wow. for, me for metabolic um, diseases. And it's not all the weight issue that the, the women lose weight quicker when they're breastfeeding. There are other benefits that aren't well understood. Yeah, my wife liked that part of the, the, the uterine contractions <laughs> and lose weight and stuff. Okay, so now we have a healthy, happy baby suckling at the mom's mm -hmm. breast and um, getting the nutrients, helping the mom out. Eventually, that baby's got to go to sleep. <laughs> please, <laughs> so, please go yes. to sleep. So, um, you know, not, not, not as much sleeping through the night, but ha how does a baby sleep? Yeah. So, infants sleep in little fits and starts. The first day, they often sleep a lot, recovering from the stressful delivery. And the next few days, not so much. And then I tell families, by two weeks, you're going to get into a little pattern with the baby's, baby's sleep. I do think that we have a, a generation that has a baby, that have children with sleep issues, and that maybe we need to step back in some, with some of our parenting techniques and teach people how to encourage their children to develop good sleep habits. In France, they have a national program where um, pretty much they, they have a way they think of infant sleep that really encourages babies to sleep through the night much younger, and we're starting to try to teach some of this to our parents. Sleep-deprived parents are very <laughs> interested in hearing very that. Very sleep -deprived. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I remember um, my mother disagreeing with us that, that how to put the baby in the bed, in the crib, or whether the baby should be in our bed, and what kind of crib we should get. In fact, I, I was, my older sister was trying to give me her crib with a very soft, very nice, <laughs> fluffy uh, mattress, et cetera. 
What do we know now about how babies should sleep? Yeah, so things have really changed in the last 20 years. And the party line now is that in terms of preventing sudden infant death syndrome, there are some things you can do to, to prevent it. And one is to have the baby sleep in the parent's room for six months, but not in the parent's bed. They should have their own sleep place. The baby should be slept flat on the back. The head can be turned one side or the other, but the baby should be flat on the back. And that the crib shouldn't have any of that fluffy stuff in it, no animals, blankets, or padding. And um, most notably recently, there was, a, there was concern about these sleep positioners that are sold to hold the baby in a certain position, that they're actually put the baby at risk for suffocation. Wow. So in the parents' room, but not in their bed, on their back, in a minimally occupied crib with just the baby and a swaddle or a tightly fitted blanket. What about flatheads? Yeah. So starting in 93, when we started putting kids on their backs, um, we started noticing that summer that kids had flat heads. And so people need to hold their babies. And this culture of holding babies has been lost a bit. Um, many children live in their car seats. And then at night, they're on their back. And they've developed a very flat head. And your head shape at six months of life is your head shape for the rest of your life. So parents have six months to attend to the baby's head. And the, there are kind of four things we recommend the parents to make sure their baby has a good head. One is they should consider wearing the baby in a baby wrap or a front carrier to get the kid off the back of the head. They should um, be sure the baby has a lot of tummy time whenever they're awake, put him on his tummy and encourage the motor development. I think the car seat should be left in the car. The car seat is a very deforming surface. And then just giving your baby a lot of different head positions. So if you put the baby to sleep, put the head on one side or the other, rotate the baby's you know, orientation in the crib. And those four things, I think you could really end up with a baby with a nice, beautiful, round head. And the head shape does affect the facial uh, symmetry as well. And so it's more than just the cosmetics of the posterior head. It's also the facial development. If you go online, you can find anything. But there are uh, people who have special mattresses to decrease SIDS. There are covers. There was one from either New Zealand or Australia that's supposed to prevent SIDS by stopping fumes and all these other things. You know, a, a modern mattress in, a, in a, an appropriate crib and the baby, the way you described, is that what we is know. That is totally adequate. And I think spending a lot of money, as I mentioned, on the positioners is not necessary. The mattress, as long as the baby's in the proper sleep position, they don't have to be sleeping on a rock. You know, it can be a firm mattress, but it should be a safe, safe environment. Um, we've, we've been taking this family, you know, they had their kid. We've taught them how to, how to breastfeed. We taught them how to get their kid to sleep. But before they leave the hospital, they're not going to get out without us doing some things to check on them because we're combining our sort of naturalistic approach with the things Mother Nature has taught us with what we know from medicine. So right. what else happens to that baby before they leave? Right. So 24 hours, all babies in this country receive a metabolic screening test. It's a little heel prick test, and the state checks for 70 unusual diseases. And most babies are fine, of course, but occasionally we'll find a baby that has, let's say, a no thyroid gland. You won't know from examining the baby, but you can really change the outcome drastically with just a medication. So this is a screening test that's done on every baby, very beneficial. At um, UCSD, we check a bilirubin before the baby goes home, and that's looking for a baby with jaundice. And we want to make sure all babies have a safe experience with new newborn jaundice. Because you can't tell just by seeing if they're yellow? Yeah, it's really hard. And, you know, we have babies of all different colors and babies of different ethnicities that have higher or lower risk for jaundice. Breastfeeding is this most wonderful nutritional um, intervention, but best breastfed babies do get a little bit more jaundice, so as we have more breastfeeding babies, we have to be more careful with jaundice. Um, we also check babies for hearing loss now. It's been about 10 years since the state has decided that all newborns should be screened for hearing loss, and we do a little brainstem evoked potential. We just come right into the mother's room and do this test on all babies. And there's a new test on the horizon that we've started. We've been doing it now for two years. We're looking for children with an unusual heart condition. About one in 10,000 children has an ab the absence of a left ventricle. And it's a heart condition that may be picked up prenatally, but not always. Only half of them are picked up prenatally. And after delivery, if the baby has this condition and it's not detected, they can get very ill very fast. And about 30 kids a year die, die a year in California because of hypoplastic I mean, It's amazing. That, I mean, kids basically eat, sleep, poop, and, and so you can't always tell what else is going on. Exactly. Uh, I mean, exactly. you think a cardiac condition, you would be able to yeah. become obvious. It can be a little silent. So what we do before they go home is we put a little clip on their foot and just check the oxygen in their foot. And if it's above a certain level, it tells us that the blood is rooted through the heart correctly and that they most likely do not have this life-threatening problem. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah. So now we want kids to stay healthy throughout their lives, and we know that immunizations for generations have, have worked and helped. 
What are kids getting now from an immunization standpoint as babies and what do parents need to know? Understand that there's some fears about that mm -hmm. and, and why they shouldn't avoid this. Mm -hmm. You know, immunization has changed the life of children in this country over the last 50 years. And in San Diego County right now, we're in the middle of the biggest pertussis, whoop and cough, outbreak in 50 years. There were a thousand cases in the county last year. And interestingly, in the hospital, the only vaccine that we give to our babies is hepatitis B vaccine but um, the other vaccines can be started at two months of age. And so now we recommend during pregnancy that the mother gets a whooping cough shot, called a Tdap shot, and we tell the father to go get it as well, and we give flu vaccine to the mother. We do everything we can to protect that baby in those first few months before we can immunize them. And they call it cocooning, immunizing the whole family. Um, so the hepatitis B shot is the one shot that we recommend in the hospital. And uh, there are a lot of people in this world that are hepatitis B carriers several thousand kids a year acquire it in childhood, and it's a disease with a large burden of poor health, liver disease. Um, very easy vaccine to give, very safe, and we highly recommend it. What's the downside to vaccines? As a, as a pediatrician and as a mother, I do not see the downside to vaccine. Um, the, the risks are very, very rare and the risk of not being vaccinated is, is quite high. And especially in an area like San Diego County where we have up to 10 to 20% of children who are unvaccinated, we are gonna start having these problems with diseases, be it measles, uh, whooping cough, H flu meningitis, these things are gonna come back. I feel back. like you're giving me a history lesson right. because we haven't heard about those in so long. You know, as a young physician, I saw a lot of meningitis. Um, homophilus influenza meningitis, and then it completely went away. We have a generation of physicians who never see meningitis, and it's going to come back if people don't avail themselves of this. So it's, not okay to say, it's not okay to say, I'm not going to vaccinate my kids because everybody else is vaccinating theirs. It's no longer valid. I think that worked for a while when 99% of people were vaccinating, but enough people are rejecting that now that we have a problem. There's a wild, you know, a potential wildfire out there, and it's already starting with, with pertussis. And I just, I, I, these vaccines are very safe. This, the scientists that have encouraged us to vaccine, vaccinate our children have spent decades of their life looking at infectious disease, how to prevent it, how to safely give vaccinations. It's been done with much forethought. It's extremely safe. And I think um, people's fears are mostly unfounded. The diseases are much worse than the vaccinations. Absolutely. It's not even close. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So um, the, there's so many other things that we want to talk about. We don't have too much time left. I was going to ask you about how to pick a stroller, a crib, and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and language exposure and development. But we'll have to save those for another day. What I did want to ask you is, when should a parent start picking their pediatrician? Ah. Uh, Good question. So I think it's something you, you should think about during your pregnancy. What are you looking for? Do you want a large pediatric group or a small group? Do you want somebody who has a more naturalistic bent or somebody who's straight down the line? Um, in the hospital, we have a, a discussion with parents about this. Um, do you want to go to an academic center where there's a teaching environment? Do you want to um, have some place close to your home? So it's good to think about it. You might want to interview some people. And then we also in the hospital can discuss it further and help you find the right person for your family. If you were in charge of the world, <laughs> the baby world, let's say, yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, it, you know, as we go forward in the future, what would you like to see happen for the, for the, the care of infants and, the, and development of families and, and how this would all, where it would go and what we wanna, where we want to go next? What's the future look like in your crystal ball? So I, I'm biased because we have, a, we have a system at UCSD where we have hospitalists. There's just a few of us to take care of all the babies. But it allows us to really look at the prenatal course, make sure that nothing is missed in the newborn period. We spend a lot of time with our families. We work on breastfeeding and optimal health. And so there's a lot of time put in right up front, and I think the payoff is there. So I, I think that this across the country is happening more where there's more of a a real attention to what happens in the hospital and not just sending home people quickly and letting them figure it out on their own. It's, it's not always that easy. Yeah, I, I'm, I was picturing um, uh, education and lectures for the grandparents so that they're, they're up to date uh, on what's going on yeah. because the advice they sometimes give doesn't match with what we know. Exactly. Um, Mom, I don't mean you, so uh, <laughs> in case she's watching. Um, so the, 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 there's all these different accoutrements that are out there and stuff. Where can people get information? Where are they going to go to get information besides their pediatrician? I know you have great brochures, mm -hmm. but, but uh, online, wh where do you go to get information when you want to look up something? Mm -hmm. The AAP? I mean, yeah, who, I think who's the, the place? The AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the website is pediatrics.org, is a lovely place. They have a whole section for parent education. 
Um, in terms of breastfeeding, the, um, the government has a beautiful breastfeeding site and um, offers a lot of good information. Baby Friendly USA has also good information for parents about breastfeeding. But I think the AAP website is a good place to start. Evidence-based, common sense, you know, healthy advice for new parents. I love that common sense is now part of our yes, medical plan. Should be. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for everything that you're doing every day for all the, the babies in this area and from my family as well. So. You are very welcome. <laughs> I've been talking with Dr. Lisa Stellwagen about what's going on now with infant care. It is truly not your mother's baby. It is not your mother's pregnancy. Things have changed, but what's interesting is we've learned a lot from Mother Nature, and it turns out that so much of what Mother Nature did was correct. Now we understand how valuable that is. So taking the thought process and putting together some common sense with medicine, you can merge together a process which allows you to have an incredibly warm, loving experience with your child as you have the birth experience and your baby starts to develop, as well as making sure they're safely and well taken care of with the best scientific up-to-date knowledge. Remember, knowledge is power. I'm Dr. David Granite, and we'll see you again next time right here on Health Matters. Thank you.